Blog Talk Radio. Stephen B's Media Production is a part of the Shellcaster Network. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by members of the Churches of Christ. With your host, Stevie R. Butler, you're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Good evening, wherever you are in the world listening to this radio broadcast. Stevie B's Media Production presents the Gospel Light Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler from the state of North Carolina with my co-host, Tim Bench from the state of Texas, Glenn McMillian from the state of Texas, Courtney Carruthers from the state of Illinois, Steve Cordell from the state of Illinois, Dr. Frank Washington from the state of Florida, Clay Phillips from the state of Georgia, Brian Christian Coleman from the state of New Jersey, and Robert Lee Johnson from the state of Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, we're grateful that you're tuning into our radio broadcast this evening. This radio show is brought to you by loving and faithful members of the Churches of Christ. We ask you to take out your Bibles and study along with us. We have a very exciting show planned for your spiritual enlightenment and your edification. If you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, just give me a call to the live show at 713 955 Zero five zero eight. If you have any questions or comments for any of my co-hosts, or you can send me your emails to my new email address, ButlerSteve1009 at Yahoo.com. Or you can give me a call at Stevie B's Media Production Studio at 910-491-6405. Now, again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. And if you need any assistance in locating the congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, get out your Bibles and study along with us here on the Gospel Light Radio Show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Before we go into our program for this evening, I would ask that you would bow with me in a word of prayer that we may thank God for this opportunity. Our most kind, gracious, loving, heavenly Father, the Father, Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast and we are prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, we pray that you will be with my co-host, Tim Bench and Clay Phillips on the show this evening as they break unto us the bread of life. And also my co-host, Glenn McMillian, as he answers the questions that are on the hearts of so many. We pray that you will bless them and their families that support their efforts that they may continue to sow the seed of the kingdom. Father, we pray that you will bless our listeners who are tuning into this radio broadcast via blog talk radio, as well as through social media. We pray that they may listen well and that their hearts may be pricked and it will cause them to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you so much for sending your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that such a cruel death on Calvary's cross. For without such a sacrifice, we will not have a hope of eternal life. Father, even now, we ask that you will forgive us for the transgressions of our own heart. We know our flesh is weak, and we often fall short of your will. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us and keep us and love us all the days of our lives. And if we have been faithful until death, Father, we pray that you will save us. For us in Christ's name, we do ask it all. Amen. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. Our speakers for the show this evening in the first segment, my 
co-host Tim Bench. He serves with the Oham Lane Church of Christ there in Abilene, Texas. He'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ. And in the second segment, I have a question from my shout out platform on social media, Facebook, that I'll be posing to my co-host, Glenn McMillian. He serves with the Waterview Church of Christ there in Richardson, Texas. He will be answering our question in that segment. And then to close out the show, my co-host, Clay Phillips. He serves as the evangelist for the Rose City Church of Christ there in Thomasville, Georgia. And he'll be making his proclamation of the gospel of Christ. So open up your Bibles now and open your minds. And let's have a great show after the break. And that's what you hear me, that of my co-host, Tim Bench. Enjoy the show. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now my co-host Tim Bench and his subject, Christianity and the Confederate Flag. Good evening. As Stevie mentioned, my name is Tim Bench and I'm calling in tonight from Abilene, Texas. And as always, we want to extend a warm welcome to all of our listeners across the United States and across the globe. We are certainly 
pleased that you have chosen to spend a few minutes with us this evening for our segments and presentation, and we hope, as always, that the information and materials provided here will be beneficial, educational, and scriptural. Several years ago, I became Facebook friends with a member of the Church of Christ in Kentucky. I considered John, not his real name, by the way, to be a solid, conservative, decent member of the church. I knew that he had formerly been a Baptist, and he seemed to be a zealous, active, solid Christian, and I enjoyed multiple discussions with him in several forums. All of that changed some two years ago and in dramatic fashion. John posted photos of various rallies he participated in, with the Civil War being the prime theme. He was proudly clad as a Confederate soldier, reenacting the attempts by the South from 1861 to 1865 to, quote, defend states' rights, end quote. He then proudly posted a Confederate flag, and he babbled about the pride represented by this flag and how both the Confederate flag and the Civil War had nothing, quote, to do with racism, end quote, or with slavery itself. Another good Facebook friend of mine who is black replied that the flag very much had to do with racism. John snappily replied that the black man, who is, by the way, an MIT graduate, perhaps the world's most elite university, and one of the most level-headed and intelligent people any of us will ever meet, was awash in, quote, hate-filled ignorance, end quote. I have never been more stunned. The condescending attitude and none-too-subtle derision was bad enough and shocking enough, but even more maddening was the fact that this proud Confederate had no idea, literally, of the words of the man who himself had designed the Confederate flag in the first place. The words of William T. Thompson, April 23, 1863, quote, As a people, we are fighting to maintain the heaven-ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior or colored race. A white flag would thus be emblematic of our cause. Upon a red field would stand forth our southern cross, gemmed, preserving in beautiful contrast the red, white, and blue. End quote. How could anyone be so stunningly ignorant about the history of a cause they themselves follow? And how could anyone be so snide and hostile towards a fellow Christian whose ancestors a mere four and five generations ago were enslaved and raped and beaten and sold off uh, like cattle? How could any Christian cling to a defeated, disgraced cause and rebellion whose very foundation was, quote, the supremacy of the white race or the man over white man over, over the colored race, as William Thompson himself had said. Finally, how could anyone claim to be a Christian and yet cling to an ideology so steeped in racism and hatred? The debacle with John was only beginning. I began posting citations and studies and articles and dissertations and documented historical analysis, which proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that slavery was indeed a huge factor in the Civil War. We can see what Confederate leaders themselves had to say about the role of slavery and racial purity during this blood-drenched era of American history. I want everyone to listen carefully to the following quote. The new Constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institutions, African slavery as it exists among us, the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. The Constitution, it is true, secured every essential guarantee to the institution while it should last, and hence no argument can be justly used against the constitutional guarantees thus secured because of the common sentiment of the day. Those ideas, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. This was an error. It was a sandy foundation, 
and the idea of a government built upon it when the storm came and the wind blew, it fell. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and moral condition. One of the most striking characteristics of insanity in many instances is forming correct conclusions from fancied or erroneous premises. So, with the anti-slavery fanatics, their conclusions are right if their premises are. They assume that the Negro is equal and hence conclude that he is entitled to equal privileges and rights with the white man. They were attempting to make things equal, which the Creator had made unequal, end quote. These are the exact words quoted verbatim from Alexander H. Stevens from his Cornerstone Address, March 21st, 1861. What was Stevens' role? He was the vice president of the Southern Confederacy, the same confederacy that John so idolized. And Stevens made no secret in the slightest that the basis of the confederacy was, and I quote, the Negro is not equal to the white men. Yet 150 years later, we seem to be beset daily with supposed Christians like John who wave their Confederate flags and babble about Southern pride and how the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery when the architects of that very war said themselves that the foundations of the rebellion was slavery and was based on race and was based on keeping the Negro in his proper place. I posted these quotes in reply to John that fateful day, and he immediately began deleting them one by one. Not only was John woefully ignorant of the history that he clung to and cherished, he absolutely and categorically did not want any information proving him wrong to be seen, and he would simply ignore it. This shameful excuse for a Christian did not have the backbone, guts, or the morals to admit that he was wrong, and to admit that the nonsense he had been spoon-fed his entire life was demonstrably false. Did John ever say, gee, I was wrong? Did John even read the quotes from Alexander Stevens and from Jefferson Davis and from William Thompson and from the litany of other sources shared with him? Did he ask the black MIT graduate to forgive him for being so callous and thoughtless? No, no, and no, he did not. He doubled down and he mocked and ridiculed a black MIT graduate as being, quote, ignorant, while another Christian jumped in and told that same MIT graduate he needed to, quote, go study more and to, quote, zip it, end quote. For a moment, try and comprehend the irony of Confederate sympathizers telling a black man to go study more when they themselves are deleting historical sources and documents as fast as their fingers will move across a keyboard which run counter to their insane beliefs. Finally, after the abuse heaped upon the black MIT graduate reached its crest, Mr. Confederacy set up a fake Facebook account under an assumed alias so that he could continue to unleash his torrent of racial hatred. All of this from a devout Christian. Here is a very small sampling of more proofs of slavery being one of the prime causes of the Civil War, which I posted for John to see and for others to see, and which John removed as quickly as he could. After all, who wants inconvenient things like facts to get in the way? From the state of Mississippi's Declaration of Secession, sentence two, quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, end quote. Eric Foner, professor of history at Columbia University in New York, quote, read South Carolina's declaration of the causes of secession. It is all about protecting slavery, end quote. From the Civil War Preservation Trust, quote, the Civil War was the culmination of a series of confrontations concerning the institution of slavery, end quote. 
and from AmericanHistoryAbout.com, quote, with Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin in 1793, cotton became very profitable. This machine was able to reduce the time it took to separate seeds from the cotton. However, at the same time, the increase in the number of plantations willing to move from other crops to cotton meant a greater need for a large amount of cheap labor, i.e. slaves. Thus, the southern economy became a one-crop economy depending on cotton and therefore on slavery, end quote. I posted links that night to studies from Harvard and from Princeton and the, from the Smithsonian, and John deleted each and every one like a petulant child simply because his beliefs and his political stances and his religious stances were proven to be in gross error. Nothing that I could provide for him in terms of historical proof was going to be read by him or considered by him or even accepted by him. And the reaction that he had to a fellow Christian who happened to be black was far worse than the treatment that I received. What a pitiful, sad, sorry Christian example. And one can only wonder how many others had been led astray by this willful ignorance through the years. How many in John's sphere of influence walk around and believe that their Confederate attire and their flags and their defense of Southern pride is not rooted in racist hysteria? How many Christians has John influenced to hate their fellow man or reject as a lesser person simply because of their skin color? John proudly waving his Confederate pride while saying the standards and tenets of the Confederacy were not racist is akin to me wearing a Planned Parenthood flag and T-shirt today, yet complaining that the organization has nothing whatsoever to do with abortion. It is nonsensical, and it is absurd. Racism is every bit as alive and thriving today as it has been at any point in American history, and that should come as no surprise to anyone who spends even a few minutes watching the daily or national news or being on Facebook. What is especially discouraging and frustrating and maddening is the number of Christians who claim to follow Christ and love their fellow man who turn around and embrace race-based ideas of separation and of hatred and of exclusion and are so often stunningly stupid about the history of their own beliefs. They simply regurgitate their ignorance over and over and over again like John. Nothing will drive people away from the Bible and away from the gospel and away from the name of Jesus Christ faster than racial superiority promoted from our pulpits and from our preaching. Racism from the church is not a bygone relic from the 1860s or the early 1900s or from generations now in the past. Over the past few years, I periodically come across a shortwave radio broadcast from a Church of Christ in LaPorte, Colorado, which adheres to Christian identity doctrine. But don't allow the name Church of Christ to fool you. This church and its preachers, namely the now deceased Peter J. Peters, espouse the belief that Caucasians are the, quote, chosen race of God, and that blacks are inferior. Only Germanic people, meaning Anglo-Saxon, Nordic, etc., are the true descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and thus can be saved. Europeans are the chosen people, and Jews are the cursed offspring of Cain, or the serpent hybrid, or serpent seed, a belief known as the two seed line doctrine, and only whites can achieve salvation and paradise. This is a quote from the Southern Poverty Law Center in regard to Pete Peters and the Laporte Church of Christ. Quote, from the pulpit and in his newsletters and radio broadcasts, Peters propounded his white supremacist views, claiming to have biblical proof that whites are God's chosen people and people of color are inferior and soulless, end quote. This viewpoint, as startling as it may be, is not a rarity, and there are dozens of groups and organizations and churches which promote separatism and racism. One needs only to access the website of the Southern Poverty Law Center or the Anti-Defamation League to read the amount of outright seething, hatred, and ideology promoted from many a pulpit. We shouldn't be surprised then when individuals act upon these types of teachings. 
For example, several years ago, the media was overwhelmingly focused on the slaughter of nine black members of a Methodist church in Charleston, South Carolina. And the motives of the now convicted killer, Dylan Roof, have been attributed to everything from lax gun control laws, medications that he may or may not have been taking, to influences from both the far right and the far left and so on. But racism, pure and simple, is what drove Dylan Roof to commit his crime. That's what that's his own words, as per his own statements to the arresting police. Four years ago, we witnessed Nazis marching through the streets of Charles, Charlottesville, Virginia, the very epitome of Aryan supremacy. And we've all seen the images of the carnage which ensued as David Duke smiled and spoke with reporters, as Nazis drove cars through crowds at breakneck speeds, maiming and killing, as we were told by certain political leaders that there were, quote, very fine people on both sides. These same people in Virginia, with swastikas on their arms and performing Nazi salutes, would without question adhere to the doctrines of their Fuhrer, who stated, this was from January 7, 1942, the exact words from Adolf Hitler, quote, I don't see much future for the Americans. It's a decayed country. They have their racial problem and the problem of social inequalities, my feelings against Americanism are feelings of hatred and deep repugnance. Everything about the behavior of American society reveals that it's half Judaized and the other half negrified. How can one expect a state like that to hold together? End quote. Within the congregation that I attend here in Texas, we have multiple ethnicities. The church has black members, it has Hispanic members, it has white members and so on. And I myself have both German and Indian ancestry. It's vitally important that we all have a scriptural and biblical understanding of how we are to view race if this is to be a unified, united family, if our church is supposed to be dedicated to the service of an almighty God. So tonight, I'd like for us to briefly examine racism from a biblical perspective and ask the ensuing questions which would follow along. Is it acceptable? Does the Bible condone or encourage racism? Most importantly, what does the Bible itself say? First, what is racism? Racial hatred focuses on the outward appearances rather than the inner man. The first thing that a prejudiced person notices is skin color. And perhaps we all unconsciously or subconsciously notice whether the person we just met is white or black or Hispanic or Oriental, just as we might notice whether that person was short or tall or left-handed. However, there are some that not only notice skin color, but they immediately formulate attitudes of acceptance or rejection based solely on one's color of skin or even their country of birth or their family lineage, as I saw with my former Facebook friend, John. Racial discrimination is senseless, and it is ungodly. Racial hatred and prejudices are totally antagonistic to and opposite of the mind of Christ that caused him to give up his equality with God and come to earth for the specific purpose of dying for all men. First question, has the Church of Christ been guilty of racism over the years? And the answer is yes, regrettably so. From J.D. Tant in his writing in Kansas in the Gospel Advocate from February 5, 1898, quote, Negro equality runs high here. Negroes ride in the same coach, go to the same school, eat at the same table with white people, sometimes sleep in the beds of their white neighbors, all of which I'm glad to say is not tolerated in heathen Texas, end quote. The very well-known Church of Christ preacher Foy Wallace, perhaps the most well-known Church of Christ preacher in the last 100 years, made the following comments on the black evangelist R.N. Hogan, who had the audacity to stay overnight in the home of Ira Rice, Jr. in 1941. This is a quote from Foy Wallace. Aside from being an infringement of the Jim Crow law, it is a violation of Christianity itself and of all such common decency. Such conduct forfeits the respect of right-thinking people and would be calculated to stir up demonstrations in most any community 
if it be generally known, end quote. It's important to note, to note the following, that Foy Wallace did later recant later in his life of his earlier views on race, and it is to this day, again, one of the most influential Church of Christ preachers of the entire 20th century. All of us will grow and learn and develop enough over time, and if we're honest, all of us have abandoned views that we once held. From W.A. Cameron, this was a sermon preached from the Diston Avenue Church of Christ, August 15, 1954. Quote, Negro development is nil. What about examples of smart Negroes? All those Negroes who have a generous fertilization of white blood have invariably left the evidence of it behind them, but the genuine article is just where it has always been. Now, if those busybodies who are trying to run everybody's business and who are not yet able to run their own affairs will close up their shop and leave the Negro where God left him and leave God's instruction to the white man concerning the Negro exactly where and how God left it, all will be well, end quote. And finally, from why desegregation will fail from Leon C. Burns. This was delivered as a sermon at the West 7th Street Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee, on March 24, 1957. Quote, I have no objection to the Negro attending services where I preach, but for his own sake I will do all within my power to provide him a place to worship God among his own people. And... I will insist that he worship there. It should be remembered that those forces behind integration are not interested in equal education. They are but a means to an end, and the end is free and unrestrained intermarriage between Negro and whites, and they will not be satisfied until they get it, end quote. Even as late as 1960, Abilene Christian College would not allow blacks to enter as students, and it was that year that Professor Carl Spain made a historic speech at the annual lectureships, which would ultimately alter ACC's racial stances and would result in Spain actually receiving death threats from white listeners. Quote, there are some dark chapters in the history of America in which are recorded deeds as vile as have ever been perpetrated on the face of the earth. Marching under the standard of the God of Mammon and bluffing his way with ballots and bullets, the white man put his foot on the Negro's neck, quoted the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and piously recited platitudes about all men being created free and equal. I feel certain Jesus would say, ye hypocrites, you say you're the only true Christians and make up the only true church and have the only Christian schools, yet you drive one of your own preachers to denominational schools where he can get credit for his work and refuse to let him take Bible for credit in your own schools because the color of his skin is dark. Are we moral cowards on this issue? We fear the mythical character named Jim Crow more than we reverence Jesus Christ, end quote. This is documented church history, and it's important to realize just how much progress has been made over the last few decades for all of us, but especially for our younger people, regardless of their, car, their color. It is startling that just over 50 years ago, blacks were not allowed to enroll as students at a Christian college. This is the very definition of racism, exemplified not only from our pulpits, but from our colleges as well, not long ago. But yet, for all the progress made, we still have those today who cling desperately to these evils, such as John, under trite terms such as, quote, Southern pride, end quote. Racial hatred produces division rather than unity. At the time Jesus lived, the Jews, specifically the Pharisees, had totally separated themselves from anyone they considered unclean. They had absolutely nothing to do with the Gentiles. This attitude of prejudice made it difficult to bring about the unity in Christ between Jew and Gentile that God desired. John chapter 17, verses 20, 21, and 22 contain a portion of Christ's prayer for unity among believers. Reading these verses, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through your word, that they all may be one, 
as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that also they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. We should be impressed with how important unity is to God by the fact that this prayer came in the shadow of the cross. From Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The various laws of mankind can be well-meaning, they can be well-intentioned, but they'll never accomplish racial peace and love as does conversion to Jesus Christ. If we follow the footsteps of Jesus as we're supposed to, in 1 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22, we will love all men, showing partiality to none and being prejudiced against no one merely due to race. God's plan for salvation has always been open to all. Centuries before Christ came to fulfill his divine purpose, Isaiah prophesied of the church that all nations shall flow into it from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. The very day it was established, the church included members from every nation under heaven, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwellings in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, according to Acts 2, verses 9 through 11. With so many nations represented, a variety of skin colors was inevitable, particularly con- considering the inclusion of Egyptians and Arabs. Among the many conversion stories recorded in scriptures is the account of an Ethiopian man taught and baptized by Philip, the evangelist, in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 38. And for the record, skin tone is a visible identifier of Ethiopians, according to Jeremiah 13, 23. The apostle Peter was sent by God to preach to the first Gentiles who would obey the gospel. And he concluded, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Acts 10, verses 34 and 35. Regardless of race or nationality, God's standard of judgment is nothing other than obedience. Finally, the Apostle Paul repeatedly emphasized that salvation is meant for all people, Romans 1, 16, irrespective of their nationality or their race. You can also reference Galatians 3.28 and Colossians 3.11. Jesus instructed the apostles to proclaim his gospel to all people everywhere, Matthew 28.19, Mark 6.16, Luke 24.47, etc. John, the Confederate flag waver, seems to have missed this section of the Bible completely. The Great Commission instructs us to take the gospel unto the whole world, not simply to Europe or Australia, and it should come as no surprise that heaven itself will be populated by a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Again, I want us to consider this uh, and how we, ap- how we apply these teachings and these viewpoints to our own lives. Anyone who hates or considers another inferior simply due to their race or skin color is simply not following the words of Jesus Christ or even the Bible itself. Skin color should be as relevant to us in deciding another's worth as their eye color or their hair color. I don't care what color my friend from MIT is. I don't care how tall he is, nor do I care about any physical attribute he may or may not have. What I do care about is that he is a Christian. And what I do care about is that due to one simple term, that being Christian, he and I are brothers, just as I would consider Stevie Butler to be my brother or Sean Woods to be my brother. Time and time again, Jesus taught his disciples to not think in terms of personal superiority, but to be humble, willing to serve others, 
and he demonstrated this in the most forceful of ways by washing his own disciples' feet as the very Son of God. Tonight, in closing, I want each of us to honestly ask ourselves this difficult question. Do you at times find yourself judging others not by their merits or their morals or their hearts, but by their skin color or their last name or where they may have been born or who their parents were? Do we reflect Jesus in our lives and attempt to bring the gospel to anyone and everyone, or do we isolate ourselves within the groups that we know and are most comfortable with? This, is again, has been a topic throughout American history, and it's certainly a topic in today's news and societal struggles, and it is certainly a contemporary church issue as well. All of us have come across a John in our lives who claimed to be a follower of Christ on one hand while despising and sniping at others of a different color, all the while justifying their nauseating set of twisted beliefs on flatly false information and lies, helping them to justify their own bigotry and hatred in their own minds. If you tonight have been guilty of prejudice or racism, Analyze for yourself what the New Testament tells us and what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us and what he specifies with his commands, his words, his actions, his deeds. And tonight, if anyone has a need that we could study with you about, whether whether it be a, a, a biblical issue, whether it be this issue, anything that we can help you with, we are always here to assist you. And as I stated earlier, we are certainly glad that you have joined us this evening, and we hope that this and all lessons on the gospel light will always be beneficial to you. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight, and God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Is your congregation in need of lending for a building or expansion project? As your partner and advocate, Diversified Financial Network will take the time to understand your unique situation and develop a financing solution that meets your specific need. It's an exciting time for your congregation, and what you need is a company with expertise in church financing early in the process. Call us today at 1-866-513-6665 or visit us at www.diversifiedfinancegroup.com. These are the announcements for the events and activities in the Churches of Christ. If you'd like to have your events and activities announced on this radio broadcast, please contact me at Stevie B's Music Production Studio at 910-491-6405. Or send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, I will not be making any public announcements until further notice regarding public meetings or assemblies, but I will be making announcements regarding the events and activities that are happening here on social media. But I do have one congregation to announce the Helen Street Church of Christ here in Fayetteville, North Carolina, has begun meeting again back in their building, and their services begin at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, and the worship Bible study will start after their worship service. Also, they will maintain their services on Zoom as well. So both services will be going simultaneously. That is the Helen Street Church of Christ here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Also, on Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and 9 p.m. Central Standard Time and 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there will be a nationwide gospel call that is sponsored by the Church of Christ in Highland Heights from Houston, Texas. And the telephone number to this call is 857-216-6700. And the access code is 328497. This is a nationwide outreach to those who are not members of the Churches of Christ. And the speakers will be presenting a basic salvation message for them to learn what they must do in order to be saved, as well as information about the Churches of Christ. It's also intended to edify and strengthen the faith of those who are Christians. On Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, the Delcrest Church of Christ from San Antonio, Texas, presents the Women's Virtual Bible Class, and this class will be held on www.zoom.com. And the class ID number is 
daily at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time, the Ladies in Christ prayer line hosted by the Church of Christ from Lafayette, Louisiana. And the number to that prayer line is 605-472-5203. And the access code is 514-859. My co-host Steve Cordell here on the Gospel Light Radio Show has a new book entitled God, Grace, and You. And you can order this book from the 21st Century Christian Catalog. There will be a spring summer series every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. There will be a preacher's panel discussion during Minister Michael Crusoe as he moderates a series of discussions featuring seasoned preachers in the Brotherhood of the Churches of Christ. And the topic under discussion will be expanding the role of women in Christian worship, a word from the Lord. And just a program reminder, Stevie B's new production presents. We're airing live shows here on Blog Talk Radio every Tuesday at from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'll be hosting a live show, What a Word from the Lord Radio Show. And each week on that broadcast, I have a guest speaker from the Brotherhood of the Church of Christ who is presenting a lesson from the Word of God. Also, we have a community corner segment. That segment is designed for small business owners and entrepreneurs who have products and services. For our communities. I also have three co-hosts on that show, Lou Gillard from the Old Book Park Church of Christ there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my newest co-host, Shauna Otis, she has the Mid-Tennessee Singles Ministry from the Great Way Church of Christ there in Nashville, Tennessee. Also, my newest co-host, Isa Mullins from the Helen Street Church of Christ here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Then on Thursday night, I'm hosting a live show from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, the show entitled The Gospel Light Radio Show. And I have eight co-hosts on this show who will be presenting messages from the Word of God. And each week I have two of my co-hosts on the air with me. I'm also taking a question from my social media platform on Facebook that I'll be posing to one of my co-hosts on this live show. And then on Friday night at our new time from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting a live show, Stevie B's Acapella Gospel Music Flash Radio Show. And on this broadcast, I'm playing some of the world's greatest acapella gospel music artists, the sweet sounds of voices. Also, I'm, we have the Story Glory segment where I'm interviewing artists on this broadcast. And on uh, June the 4th, that'll be the first Friday of June, I'll be featuring the artist. Irvin C. Jackson from Wesley Chapel, Florida. He'll be debuting two new singles on that program. And we're also doing the Top 20 Countdown show. That'll be the third Friday of the month. We'll be doing that show. And also, we have our own demand episodes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can't catch any of these live shows here on Blog Talk Radio, wherever you're getting your uh, favorite podcast from, uh, there's just a variety of musical platforms that you can use these shows are available on some of the major ones I always like to promote here on this show is Spotify, Apple iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, YouTube, and just to name a few. I'd like to give a shout out to all of my sponsors. I have a new sponsorship manager. Her name is Michelle Marco from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And if you'd like to sponsor these radio shows, you can just give her a call at 954-687-4705. I'd like to give a shout out to all of my sponsors, Sharon Norwood from Chicago, Illinois, Bethesda Memorial, Food Director Crematorial Services from DeSoto, Texas, uh, Stanley Phillips from Little Rock, Arkansas, Cheryl Mara from Charlotte, North Carolina, Con- Yvonne Blazing Cracker Duke from Nashville, Tennessee, Melvin Jackson from High Point, North Carolina, Marquise Hallman from Charlotte, North Carolina, Stephanie Booker Wilson from Greensboro, North Carolina, Diversified Family Network LLC from Dallas, Texas, known as Marcus Charlotte Carroll, and Ordained Faith Publishing from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The three E's of Stevie B's Media Production it is the objective of this broadcast. We want to educate, we want to edify, we want to encourage you in the study of God's Word. And that will conclude our program announcement. Stay tuned. Our shout out question is coming up next. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Shut it up, shut it up, oh yeah. Six three in the morning, and my heart's so heavy I can't sleep. All alone and wondering. 
Does anybody really care about me? Tears are flowing softly. Got my face as I kneel down to pray. Do I need your strength or not? It's been a rough day. When someone say they love you, that don't mean that they are gone. There to take your heart and use you to end up with their own welfare. And in your hurt, you remember how you ready can make birds life in his way. I lift my hands and say, Thank you, Lord. It's been a rough day. Sometimes I just walk around singing. Not every day you're working Two or three jobs to make it through To take care of those little ones Who seldom say that they appreciate you That's when I think of you, God you could have quit, but if that was sown in the way, then my problems just don't seem so large. It's just a rough day. So speak into my heart a lot. Troubles all around me in this place. Sometimes it gets so heavy. I just don't think that I can face another day. When I think of heaven, the week, when trouble days are over, I can hear you say, oh, welcome home, my child, no more of day, tears falling down my face, I say, shut it up, shut up, shut it up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut I don't need no words, I just say Oh, Lord, that mess, it gets so rough on me, y'all Late at night, late at night When you think you don't have no way out Just remember Remember that joy Joy comes in the morning Then you can go on it's just a rough, a rough day. Oh, Lordy, it's just a rough day. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Shout it out question. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the portion of the broadcast where I have a question from my social media platform called Shout It Out. And we want to pose this question to my co-host. We also want to encourage our listeners to join that group and get involved in those biblical discussions. Now, my co-host on the show that will be answering this question is Glenn McMillian. He serves with the Waterview Church of Christ there in Richardson, Texas. How you doing, my brother? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Now, we have a doozy for you. Now, this question is from an anonymous queries from the state of North Carolina, and here's the question. If Luke was not an apostle, how can we know his writings are true? What say you to this question? This is a a very interesting question. Luke was not an apostle. That is correct. And therefore, do we have any question about the validity or the, the inspiration of, of the book of Luke and, uh, and by extension, the book of Acts. Um, well, let's deal with the first part of that first. So the fact that Luke was not an apostle is not a unique situation. Uh, as we know, Mark was not an apostle. Um, James, uh, the James that wrote the book of James was not an apostle. He's the brother of, of Jesus. Uh, not the Apostle James. 
um, the writer of Hebrews, uh, if we don't believe that it was uh, Paul, which we have a lot of reasons to not believe it was Paul, then the writer of Hebrews was not an apostle, uh, and Jude was not an apostle either. So uh, if you're going to reject books that are not written by apostles, you have to reject all of those books, uh, and not just Acts and Luke. And if you compare, uh, comparing Luke to uh, Matthew and Mark, you're not going to see a whole lot of differences there. So if Luke's information is unreliable, then what does that say about Matthew and Mark? Is is where in in what where are you going with that? So the question is, if, if it really boils down to, can we rely on what Luke wrote? If do we have number one uh, any evidence that Luke was an inspired writer? If he wasn't an apostle, was he inspired? Uh, and if not, uh, or and if even if we can or cannot prove that. Are his writings reliable? And I think the easiest answer to that question is, again, understanding the book of Luke in its context, and, and the, not book, Luke and Acts in, in its context. That, that uh, Luke and Acts were written by uh, a historian, a, a man who was commissioned by the Roman government, a Roman uh, official uh, Theophilus <clears throat> to report on what this whole Christianity thing, Christianity thing was about. And he wrote the first book of Luke. We're not exactly sure when that was done, but the book of Acts was done uh, by the time that Paul was arrested at Rome. That took place around 65-ish A.D., so we know that the book of Luke was written before that, so around, probably around 60 uh, AD, um, maybe I mean, at, at the latest 65 AD. So we say that to say that the, pe- the that Luke was written and was being circulated amongst the churches in a contemporary time when first and second generation Christians were around. Uh, they would have still been alive. They would have still been able to uh, verify the events that were written in the book of Luke, compare those to, that were written to, uh, to other uh, information that was contemporary, the book of Acts and the book of, uh, uh, or sorry, the book of uh, Mark and the book of Matthew were also uh, completed around the same time, circulating around the same time. Uh, in fact, Mark was probably circulating a little bit earlier and in there and that and so if the people that were there that knew that the what the events surrounding Jesus' life and were were of the same generation or, or one generation removed from the events of Jesus' life and also included uh, some of the apostles who were still around um, and they accept these texts as being valid and legitimate, these, and they were considered considered to be uh, authoritative by those people. Then we don't really have any reason on our end, two thousand years later, to to question uh, at that point, um, because again, there's some question as to whether Luke got his information from uh, the book of Mark. So the theory is that the book of Mark was already circulating around 45, 50 AD. Therefore, Luke would have had access to it. And that's the the starting point for for Luke's writing of the book of Luke. Even if that's true, we we see that the book of Luke contains information that Mark doesn't contain. And... So he would have had to do additional research to add that information in. And again, none of that information was ever rejected by the early church. Uh, again, the, the early church fathers, as they're, they're called by historians, these are influential leaders of the church during the first and second generations of the church. Uh, 
quoted liberally from uh, the book of Luke, never had any problems with the additional information that Luke added, never had any issues with uh, that kind of, um, you know, any kind of quote-unquote contradictions between Luke and Mark. They never um, had any issues there. So if they didn't have any issues, we, us coming, you know, two, almost 2,000 years later and saying maybe that this, these things don't add up, when we lack the, uh, the proximity to the event, uh, seems a little arrogant on our part to, to say that, there, that there's a problem. So are, are there issues that do come up? Are there quote-unquote contradictions or things? Yes, there are details that are different between Luke and, and Mark, between Luke and Matthew. Uh, and, but most of those things can be resolved very quickly by, by closely examining the text and really taking a look at what the context is. Uh, the main one that uh, people bring up just as an example is that uh, – Luke talks about the census uh, that was taking place at the, around the time of the, the birth of Christ, and he mentions that there is a governor uh, named Quintus. And so the argument is that uh, the census that Luke is referring to and, and Quintus could not have happened at the same time because Quintus was not governing until 6 AD, according to Josephus, and this census would have had to take place in 8 or 9 B.C., uh, but we have evidence uh, of a Mr. Elder. Uh, what's his first name? Uh, I forgot to write down his first name. But there's, uh, in his a book called um, uh, What is the name of this book? <laughs> uh, let me get my make sure I get my quotations correct. John Elder, in his book called Prophets, Idols, and Digger, says that there is evidence that Quintus was, uh, he pulled a, an Andrew Garfield and, and served two terms non-consecutively. So his first term was actually served in around 7 BC. So that's very close to the time that this census would have taken place. So it is, it is likely that Quintus was actually the, the governor at the time of this census. Uh, that that Luke refers to, and Luke refers to the second census in Acts chapter five, and specifically uh, mentions that this was a census that took place before uh, uh, um, before Herod was was the devil. So there is a, a in all of the other contradictions and all of the other uh, complaints about the book of Luke. Are, are similar. There, there are. If you look at them on the surface, and you only uh, take a, a surface examination of it, then it seems like it might be contradictory. It doesn't make sense. But if, if you really look into the details and really dig a little bit, you'll see that uh, these things really do wash out in Luke's favor. So as we can see, there, you know, a couple of historians can that can verify uh, Sir William Ramsey studied the book of Luke for 30 years and concluded that Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, this author should be placed amongst the very greatest of historians. Uh, and he, he also says that Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect to his trustworthiness. Another historian uh, uh, thinks Paul Unger, he says that uh, the Acts of the Apostles is now generally agreed in scholarly circles to be the work of Luke, to belong to the first century, and to involve labors of the careful historian who was substantially accurate in his use of sources. So we have the fact that Luke was written contemporary with first and second century Christians who could have verified and, and would have rejected uh, this, this book from being in the canon if it, they had seen these massive contradictions that people are uh, alleging. And people who have actually studied this stuff in, in our modern times for multiple years have seen that, that Luke's, Luke's uh, 
writings are historically accurate and reliable to uh, the same standards that other historical documents are are usually held to. Uh, we don't really have any reason to doubt uh, Luke's uh, authenticity or his his uh, his accuracy or his trustworthiness uh, and his and his deserving. Uh, Deservingness to be in uh, the gospel canon, so uh, I don't think that this is an issue that we as Christians need to worry about. Uh, again, there are lots of things that you could study if you would, if you'd like to go into more depth of this, uh, but I don't think it's something that we we need, really need to, to stress out about or lose any sleep about uh, the, the gospel of Luke. Again, with the gospel of Mark and the gospel of Matthew, all have survived in the canon for the Islam because they have stood up to uh, multiple layers of scrutiny over the last 2,000 years. So not something that you need to, to lose sleep over. Hunter. No. Shout it out, shout it out, question. <laughs> You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. I know, Lord, I know the Lord, you'll take care, you'll take care, take care of me. Oh, yeah, you see, we, we, I know the
You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Give your attention to the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now my co-host Clay Phillips and his subject, the hand that rocked the cradle. And good evening. Once again, we are so thankful that God has allowed us to be able to come and preach his unadulterated truth. We want to thank uh, both speakers for doing a marvelous job. Uh, and answering the question, and also uh, preaching God true. Now, I want to say this, that this month is a representative of Mother's Day. And if your mother is still alive, you ought to be very uh, happy. Uh, even if your mother is gone, you still should be happy because uh, mothers have done so much for us. And so I want to call your attention to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. And I want to read uh, verse 10 to verse 13. Proverbs chapter 31, and the verse is, number 10 through 13. And we find these words written. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does say the test and trust in her so that she shall be no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wood and flex and worketh willing with her hand. Thus is the reading of our scripture on this evening. I want to use for a subject today, the hand that rocks the cradle. The hand that rocks the cradle. I want to help us understand uh, four, I'm going to give you four homiletics, and then we're going to do the best we can. Four homiletics. Uh, the first thing we want to look at is a divine comment from God. A divine comment from God. And then number two, we want to look at a mother devotion to the divine, a mother's devotion to the divine. And then uh, number three, we want to look at the fear of man, the fear of man, the praise of a virtuous woman. The fear of man is the praise of a virtuous woman. So now, if you will, let us now understand uh, and look, if you carefully, at the text. Look at Proverbs 31 and the verses number 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is for above ruby. Now, when you notice the text, is asking the question, which is called a query. This question is called a query. It's uh, it deal with uh, a addressing of two things. Number one, it addresses the official administrative duty of a woman, of a mother. It deal with the official administrative duty of the mother or the wife. 
Then it says, and also in a query, it deals with the organization, uh, particular purpose. In other words, the purpose of the woman. So here we find in the text why the question is asked, because most cannot, listen to me now, most cannot see a the devotion of the divine mother. Most cannot see it. You remember the story in First Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 through 17, Eli was the prophet, and you remember Hannah did not have any children, and she prayed to God, and she came to the temple, came to where you would think someone would be concerned about her having children, because in biblical days, if a woman had a child, she knew she couldn't birth the Messiah. And all women looked forward to birthing the Messiah. And so as Hannah was praying in the temple, Eli did not recognize the devotion of a divine, uh, a mother's divine devotion. And she was praying. And she would, it was, her anxiety was so deep. Uh, the Bible says, that her mouth was moving, and, and Eli looked at her and said, you drunken woman, why do you come up here drunk? And oftentimes, uh, mothers and women are misinterpreted uh, because they, most people don't understand a mother's devotion to the divine. In other words, that's why mothers pray for their children. Mother is standing there for us. You remember uh, when we go back to Genesis, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, you remember God created everything and said it was good. And the only thing that God said that was not good in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it talked about uh, it is not good that man should be alone. And so he made Man, a help me, which is woe man, that came out of the man, woe man. And so here we understand that man needed help. Man needed somebody uh, to be able to help him. So when you look at the text, uh, the woman is the solution. Now, help, listen to this, listen to this. The woman, according to Proverbs, is the solution to official uh, administrative duties of the home. And not only that, it is the organization in particular with a particular purpose. Now, uh, and so we need to understand that God gives the woman, listen, to help the man Solve the problem. She is the one that understands <laughs> man. She's the one that, that God says not good, that man should be alone. I will make him help me. So God made man a help me. Now, let, let, let me show you something here. Let's turn to the New Testament. We'll come back to our text. Turn to Second Peter. Everybody now turn the Bible to Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. I want to look now at uh, God has, listen now, extrapolate that which is applicable to through the woman to extend man's ability. Let me say it again. God has extrapolate. That which is applicable to extend the man's ability. In other words, we cannot become all we need to become without the woman. Amen? She is, the, the mother is the, the hand that rocked the cradle. In other words, it's, it's speaking, I'm speaking more than just, uh, just sitting there rocking the baby to sleep. I'm talking about uh, the official administrative duties, organization, uh, in particular purpose. God has given the woman particular purpose. 
to help the man. Now, in Second Peter chapter uh, 1 and verse number 3, the Bible says, According as his divine power have given unto us all things, that pertains unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and notice what it says, and virtue. So understand now, he used the word virtue here. You remember the, 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 the query is who can find a virtuous woman? And a virtuous woman, what, what is her duty? What do she do? How does she help us? How do she be with us? How do she? Uh, how do we capitalize? Listen, men need husbands. And we need to understand how to capitalize on our wives and on those hands that rock the cradle, the women that are in our lives. How can we capitalize? So now let's, let's read that again in Second Peter chapter one, according as the divine power. In other words, everything that was created in God's divine power, the woman was created in God's divine power, the man was created in God's divine power. How do you know? So the Bible says he created man from the dust of the earth, God's divine power. He created woman in God's divine power. Ha, from the rear, put man to sleep, man woke up, and there was the wife. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, thank God Almighty, rock cradle. Hello? So here we have, according as the divine power, have given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we have, God have made sure that we have what we need. We got the hand that rocked the crater. We got the hand that can help us out. Through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. So remember now, this, who can find a virtuous woman? Now, remember, I told you that God has extrapolated. In other words, in his own providential schedule, have given us what we need that is applicable to extend the duties of man. Look at verse number four. It says, whereby are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promise, that by these ye might be protectors of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Notice what it said. And beside, and beside this, listen now, giving all diligence add to your faith. So here it says giving diligence add. And the word add here means to supply. So that God has given us everything we need to help us, so the woman is very significant in the administrative duties and also in particular purpose in our lives. So how you say that? Is it add to your faith? The first thing to add to your faith is virtue. <laughs> and so when, when you can add virtue to your faith, so it's adding a woman, hello, adding a woman that has virtue, can, because he said, not good that man should be alone. So God adds something. So the, the query says, who can find a virtuous woman? So the question was asked, so in other words, so man been looking for a virtuous woman. So God says in his conversation, a divine conversation, a divine uh, talk from God, God said, let me make a comment. I want to ask you guys, who can find a virtuous woman? I'm going to ask you, man. Who can find a versus one? So God is dealing in the Proverbs, and the proverbial writer is writing down, I, Solomon said, I tried. I had 700 wives, 300 concubines, had only, uh, the Bible only talk about one son that Solomon had, that royal bomb. And that son turned out to be a nut, turned out to be foolish. Solomon, the wisest man ever lived. Now, I'm not saying Solomon may have no children. The Bible does not record but one. And so here we find who can find a virtuous woman. So God is in conversation with man and said, listen, who can find a virtuous woman? So it says, I want you to understand, beside this, 
giving all diligence. In other words, we ought to give diligence to find virtue. That's only a virtuous woman. It says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. If, notice what it says. For if these things be in us, or abound in thee, they make you neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see, or for often have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So here we find a marvelous uh, example. Let's go back to our text now. Let's go back to it. Who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find a virtuous woman? Now, when you look at who can find a virtuous woman, we need to understand the New Testament removes and helps remove the stigma of the woman because uh, there is no fear of man like the fear that the woman uh, and men often, oftentimes say it had not been for the woman, we would not have been in the situation we're in. No, no, no. God has removed the stigma of the woman because of being prayed. In other words, most men are not, uh, do not give praise to virtuous women. And the problem with us, those of us, uh, we, you know, even our mother that rocked the cradle that brought us in this world, we need to understand we need to give honor to our mothers. The Bible, the, the Ten Commandments, four, deal with God, four, deal with the relationship of a man and man. Man and God, man and man. The first one that deal with man and man said, give him with God. And so honor thy father and thy mother. And so the hands that rocked the cradle, we need to understand that God, let, let, let me, let's look at, uh, let's go to the New Testament again. We'll go back and forth. I don't need this tie in. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. And the verse is number 9. First Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest appear with shamefacedness, sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or uh, pears that, that perish and costly array. In other words, don't get caught up into the world's custom, but which become women professing godliness with good work, with good works, with good works. But I suffer not. Another verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, because at one time the women could not learn. This is the first time the Bible demonstrates, listen, let the woman learn. Now the woman can learn. The, the church has given a opportunity for the woman to learn. Now, but it says, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor use of authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. This says, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and in charity and in holiness and sobriety. So what is teaching us here? That listen, God said, listen, I'm, I'm removing the stigma that you cannot praise, that you cannot honor a woman. It says, who can find a virtuous woman? <laughs> so it's given us. Now, now, there's a differentiation. Stay with me now. There's a differentiation in uh, ambition and anointing. There's a difference between ambition or an ambitious woman or a woman that has been anointed. Now, God gives us the example of a woman that is anointed. That God said, I will pray this woman. I'm going to say this is who can find a virtuous woman. I'm going to tell you what it's all about. So we have, now, now what is ambition? A, a woman has to be careful not to be too ambitious. That's what happened to Eve. In the Garden of Eden, she became too ambitious. So now, ambition is uh, 
independent. Now, uh, what is independent? Uh, I don't need nobody in my life. Oh, we all need somebody. It's not good that man to be alone, so it's not good that woman. Now, I'm not teaching that every woman and every man should get married. The Bible teaches us in the book of Matthew that some are born units and et cetera, et cetera. So we're not talking about, we're talking about the, those that burn with desire, those that have to get married, like Brother Phillips. I had to get married. Been married this October 22nd, 5 o'clock, be 45 years. I needed my wife. I needed a versus woman. I needed a woman to help me. So, ambition is independence, not, in other words, I don't need nobody in my life. Oh, okay, if you don't, make sure you understand that. Now, anointing is interdependent. Now, what is interdependent? Interdependent is the dependent on others, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know that you have been anointed. You know the increase of faith. Now, what is the increase? Faith, charity, and sobriety. That's what it is for Timothy. Faith, charity, and sobriety. And so here, man's greatest fear is removed. Why? Because uh, the stigma is that the woman called us to be what we are. <laughs> but, but, if the, but God created the woman for a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And the church helped us understand that. It gave us addition. It gave us supply. Add to your faith. And so here we find that we must understand the increase. Now, what, what do we mean by increase? When you study the Bible, even when God created man in the Garden of Eden, he wanted, he had a, a mandate. He had a mandate that man should, Adam and Eve, should have children to go forth and uh, replenish the earth. In other words, populate the earth. That's what God wanted man and woman to do. And so uh, the increase have always been in the mind of God. God. That's what God wanted, the increase, the global uh, nature of man. In other words, man should have a desire to globalize the world. Then there is the mandate of spirituality. In other words, Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 28, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So here we have a mandate, a man replenished the earth, having children. Amen? So in having children, somebody got to rock the cradle. Amen? Got to rock the cradle. And the mothers have their part. And also spiritually, God expects us uh, to go out, and, and the second mandate is to go out and baptize every nation. Now, uh, there must be an understanding of the distinctiveness of a mother, the distinctiveness of a mother. Let, let, let me show you. Tell you. Turn your Bible right now to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and the verse is 21. Ephesians 5, 21, the Bible says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. In other words, a family, a father, a mother, th when you fear God, this is what is this is what the hand that rocked the cradle, that takes care of the child, bring the child in the admonition of the Lord. Fear the Lord. It says, notice what it says in verse 22, wives, submit yourself to your own husband. As unto the law. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wife be to the own husband in everything. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Men, God have given us a wife, and it's our responsibility when we stand before God at a judgment, it's going to be a part of our mandate. Did you treat that woman right? Did you give yourself for that woman because Christ gave himself for his church? Now, now notice that not only that, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Hello? 
that he may present it to himself, a glorious church. In other words, God expects men, we must, don't you know, as on this earth, God expects us to present our wives to him? Hello? Christ got to present the church to God. We got to present our wives to them. It says, not having spot or wrinkle or any uh, such thing, but that it should be holy and without blame. So are men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it, cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members, members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. So now he reminiscing about uh, the creation. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. There is a great mystery. This is a great mystery. Oh, yes. A great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife be and see that she reverence her husband. So here we find the distinctiveness of the woman. Now, uh, let, let me say this. The hand that rocked the cradle. Uh, uh, I, a woman is a, a unique uh, creation of God because God said I, you know, man was by himself, and he said not good that man should be alone. Now, let me say something about uh, the woman. The woman is uh, demonstrate, listen to this, uh, uh, a, you know what an uh, amphibian is? Is that um, there is a thing that called anthrobiological. Anthrobiological. Now, what is anthrobiological? It is anthrobiological is two different current meaning, but that it is in existence. In other words, you have a wife. A wife is a mother. So she is a mother. She is a wife. A husband, a husband. A wife, husband is a father. Amphibians can live on the, on the land and the water. Now, an amphibian is called a cold-blooded animal. Now, a mother can become a cold-blooded animal when it comes down to her children. Oh, oh yes, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm married to one, my wife and I. I remember uh, my oldest daughter uh, did something at school, and, and the principal called me. As a matter of fact, I was at school working, and uh principal called, so just got home. My daughter got home. Old child got home. I started spanking. And you, oh, you gonna get a spanking? We got to stop this. And and my wife walked in there and said, "Now you hit her enough." And I looked at my wife and I said, "Okay." <laughs> I said, "Okay." And I looked at Chancellor. And said, I'm doing it anymore. But there's a cold-bloodedness. There's a thin line between love and hate, y'all. Y'all better hear me. Oh, a woman is something else when it comes down to her children. And that's, and see, we as men, we, we need to understand that. That when it comes down to a, a woman's children, the hand that rocked the cradle, they, they, a woman do not play by her children. Do not play. So now, let us go now back to uh, Proverbs. And let us look at the hand that brought the Christ. And look at what have frightened men. I mean, this is, but, but God gave praise. Hello now. God gave praise to the virtuous woman. But uh, men are afraid of women like this. Uh, I've, I've counseled men and talked to them and, and tell them about. And the, and the first thing they want to say, she she independent. No, 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 man. You need to understand differentiation in independent and interdependent. 
When a woman trusts God and believes in God, she is the most dangerous woman in the world. Because she pray now. When a mother prays. You remember you remember Moses? The Bible says Moses, the king Pharaoh said, kill all the children. But Moses' mother looked at Moses and said, not, not this child. And she hid him as long as she could. And then she made a basket and put him in the water. And, and you know the story. She did all that she can do. And God worked through Moses' mother. So you better be careful. If you can't deal with an interdependent woman, an independent woman is a woman that is ambitious. I'm not talking about an ambitious woman. We're talking about an in, interdependent woman. There's a difference. An interdependent woman, uh, God give her praise. And this is now, look at the text. They read some of this stuff. Now I'm going to be able to read all of it because i got about a few minutes here. Proverbs 31, verse 10. God is telling uh, the proverb writer, saying, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Now, now the, the, the term here is, is trustworthiness. A virtuous woman, there is a trustworthiness of that woman. In other words, it's not that uh, you, she's afraid of you. My wife is not afraid of me. My wife trusts God, and she knows God, and she knows if she pray, God deal with him. <laughs> I respect God in her dependentness of this woman, my wife. And you must be careful. Men, you have to remove the stigma of thinking that the woman uh, needs you. See, there's a difference between uh, need you and help you. Our needs, God take care of. But the help, God gave us a woman to take care of. What is Jesus said, you remember, no, he's talking about your need. He said, you know, the birds and the air, God take care of them. The need, you know, feel, you, you eat, you clothe, those are needs. But there's a, there's a, there's a difference in a need. And a heifer. And, and most of us men, we always think about uh, the need of the woman. No, a woman is there to help us, to make you better. The, the hand that rocked the crater is to make us better. Now, notice what it says now. So the first one in verse 10 deal with trustworthiness. And then in verse 11, it says in Proverbs 31, verse 11, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need. Now, I'm trying to told you, Pastor, no need of spoil. In other words, constant love. It's talking about, this is talking about constant love. You don't need no love because she's loving you, loving on you. Thank God for you. She's loving you. You don't, you don't need. Then in verse number 12 says, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now, what, what, what verse 12 are talking about? It talk, verse 12 is dealing with the uh, uh, infrastructure of the man. If anybody knows God a place in uh, uh, the infrastructure of a man, it's not the cow, not the horse, not the job, not your friend. It is the woman. And God put us to sleep. He went inside of our infrastructure, the real. Took the man real and made woman. Woman, who know more about the infrastructure of a man than a woman? She came from inside of us. Good God of mine. Somebody else say amen. And then verse 13. Look at verse 13. She is drifted. What it means by that is, she is, notice what it says here, uh, she seeketh wood and flex and worketh willingly, worketh willingly with her hand. If you can't 
handle a woman working, she got some issues. Working willingly with her hands. This this woman is this woman is industrial. That's what Wool here is talking about, industrial. And not only that, she cultivates seed. In other words, she creates areas in life that uh that down the road you prosper. She invests. She is a woman of investment. And a lot of men can't handle that because they're not spiritual. They don't even realize it, that they're not spiritual. I, I'm the head of the man. Right? And you don't even understand what the head means. Let me, let me, let me get on back. Verse 14. Verse 14 deal with self-starting. In other words, uh, they, they have their own self-starting. You don't have to get out of bed, woman. Get out of bed, woman. Get out. Do this. Do this. Fuck up. No. A, a, a woman that God praises, a virtuous woman, she, you know what verse 14 says? She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. <laughs> I mean, not, not, a merchant ship go on for months. It takes months to cross over. Back in, remember back in those days now, it took months to cross over. And she was uh, like a merchant ship. You might not see her for months on. But when she come back, she demonstrated. She has, she is not a wasteful person. I like that. I like the exegesis. It says she is not wasteful. That she enjoyed uh, making sure that everybody else gets something. Then verse verse 15 says, it talk about the uh, inter being an enterprise. What do you mean by that? It says she rises also while it is yet night. What? And giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maiden. In other words, she has folks working for her. Woo! <laughs> she get up early in the, before the sun rise. Now you can't handle a woman like that. You're in trouble. Amen. Everybody can't handle a Christian woman. Now this demonstrated child of God. A woman, if you are a Christian woman, this is what she. And I'm not gonna be able to deal with all of this. You need to read it on your own. Set it on your own. Get your commentary. Read it for yourself. She is. Self starting. She don't need you to wake her up. By the time you wake up, she's gone. Then in verse number 16, willing to do hard work. And I don't want my woman, my wife to work hard. Hey, hello. Willing to do hard work. Verse 16, she considereth a field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. She planted a vineyard. Good God Almighty. Somebody will say amen. Somebody will say hallelujah. You got a, a, a wife that, that worked hard. My wife, uh, we've been married, like I said, for 45 years, October 22nd, 5 o'clock. But she has always been a hard worker. That's why I married her, because she's always been a hard worker. Working the field. I caught the back. I worked in the water in the field. I'm from the old school. She worked in the field. So here, not only that, then in verse number 17, verse 17 says, she girded her lung with strength and strengthened her arms. <laughs> I like that. In other words, she worked out. She exercised. She take care of herself. Hello, she's willing to take care of her. She's willing to put the hours in. She's willing to work hard. At the same time, she knows she needs to strip her arm just like the man. In other words, she exercises. Not only does she exercise, verse 18 says, she perceived that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. 
In other words, she slept long hours reading. Isn't that some kind of woman? This is the hand that rocked the cradle. I remember my mother worked hard woman, worked in the field. I remember picking peaches and bees, peas. And I remember she was worked at the schoolhouse in the lunchroom. And, and I, I was a little boy. And, and she would holler at me. If, I'm, if I got it wrong, I was lying. Never stop raising children. Good God Almighty. Look at her. And not only that, can, can I go a little further? Can I go a little further? Let's go a little further. Verse 19. She laid her hands to the uh, spender, and her hands hold the discharge. In other words, she is not dull. She, she's energetic. She's not dull. She, she loves to spend time with her children. I mean, she, she loves to spend time. Now, it's going to mean a rod. In other words, she got a rod. You're like a shepherd that got her sheep. She got her children that rod. I remember my mother had a, a rod, stick, bat. <laughs> my mother just got ready to hit you. She hit you with whatever in her hand. She, I'm, I, one time I, she was so mad with me, angry with me, she threw a plant out me, at me. And I was like, I had to duck. Hello? Hand that rock the cradle. My time is up. And read the rest for yourself. And may God bless you. I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are, are listening uh, to the program. And men, let us be mindful. Let us be mindful to remove the stigma. And if it had not been for the woman, we would, no, if it had not been for the woman, you, if, you had, if we had done what we're supposed to do, amen? We should have been vigilant. And when men don't be vigilant, what do you mean I'm vigilant, Brother Philip? Bible study, Sunday school, worship services, Wednesday night Bible study. Read your Bible on your own. If you don't have a commentary in your house, on your car, in your whatever you with, and something wrong with you, because you're, you're not trying to, who can find? You got to look for a versus woman. And when you find her, can you keep her? <laughs> May God bless you. You may hear the gospel. The gospel is the death of burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You may believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then you can become a man that God will give you supply, virtuous things, long add to your faith. A woman add to our faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, charity. Those are things that a woman adds to a man as you rock the cradle. Raise your church. May God bless you. May God continue to bless those that listen to the broadcast. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. Hey, 
listening to the gospel light radio show ladies and gentlemen my cup is running over the gospel light radio show we have had a great show tonight the gospel has been preached we've had some great uh inspirational songs being played on this broadcast my brother uh, glenn that million did a great job in answering our shout it out question what a show what a show ladies and gentlemen i want to thank you all for tuning into this broadcast we certainly appreciate those who've been Following our radio show on Blog Talk Radio as well as on social media, Facebook Live. And I want to thank my co host, Tim Bench, for his lesson, Christianity and the Confederate flag. I don't think I've ever heard a lesson uh, quite like that before. I certainly appreciate Tim's effort on this broadcast. I also want to thank my co host, Clay Phillips, for his lesson, The Hand That Rocks the Crazy. That brother preached tonight, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. He always does a great job on this broadcast. Ladies and gentlemen, also, uh, I want to thank my co-host, Glenn McMillian, for he answered that question for us. Was Luke an apostle? And how can we know that his writings are the truth? That was a great answer uh, Brother Glenn gave as well. These gentlemen are doing a great job here on this broadcast, and I certainly appreciate all of them for, that participate on this show on a weekly basis. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just thrilled to be able to bring you a weekly broadcast. It's our prayer that the lessons that were given on the show this evening have been beneficial to your spiritual lives. 
And your relationship with the Lord has been strengthened because you're not only tuned in to this radio show, but you've given yourself over to a study of God's Word. I'm your host, Steve Robert, and I want to say on behalf of all of my co-hosts on the Gospel Light Radio Show, we really do appreciate your love and support for these radio programs. Good night, everybody. God bless you. You're listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. And if you miss me from singing, sing it. and you can't find me nowhere, nowhere. come on up to glory. glory. I'll be singing the best. Yes, I will. And I know the Lord, He will grieve me over yonder. The glory. glory, I'll be praising the best. Her minister say to see all day long. The glory. glory, I'll be singing the faith, yes I will, and I, I, I know the Lord, he will grieve So glory, I'll be praising up there. Listening to the Gospel Light Radio Show. This has been the Gospel Light Radio Show, episode 231. 